to another Monday you join. We're gonna wait a couple minutes before the talk story gets started um, so that you guys can get all online, uh, online and loaded. But Miley is here and ready to tell you more about Kona's history. Thanks. Good afternoon. Aloha. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Good fun. We are back in Greenwell store with the canned goods behind us. And it's a lovely kind of cloudy day here in Kona on Monday, the day after Mother's Day. Happy late Mother's Day, all you mothers out there. I hope you're listening. I hope the children aren't screaming <laughs> so you can't hear. That is all right. I'm wearing my missionary outfit today because we are returning to Kailua in the Kona district in the year 1823, 1823. And no missionaries are living in Kailua Kona in 1823. They are all over in Honolulu and apparently a couple are off in Kauai. But it is all Hawaii all the time. And we are happily living in Kailua. Here's Alexis fooling around with something. And Kuakini, Ka'ahumanu's brother, is the governor of the entire island of Hawaii. And he is happily living down in Kailua and running the show. And he is doing a good job, thank goodness. So I told you last week, we left. We left beautiful, we have all these little things here to show you, but we left Kailua Kona with Hualalai and the walls of Kamakahonu where Kamehameha died and history is happening and time will change and we are moving slowly towards the 1830s when Mokuaikawa Church and Hulehe'e will be built. But we are going to do the foundation work because these were major changes. We're going to do the foundation work and we have to start with Mr. William Ellis, that man who wrote this book. And this book, back in the 19th century, was a bestseller. Just as big as Michener and his Hawaii, this book might have been even bigger. William Ellis, a narrative of a tour through Hawaii in 1823. This was major. And Mr. Ellis's little English face, and I might have shown it to you last week, is right here, right here. This man says at the end of this book, what a pleasure it's been to write it. And as he's writing it, he realizes for the last 10 years of his life, he has been speaking Tahitian and Hawaiian. And that, that language is more a language of his being than the English language, which is a very interesting thing. And it makes him an excellent writer because his sympathies are with the Hawaiian people. He understands the language and he is familiar with the culture because he lived in the Society Islands for five years with his wife as an English missionary and as a printer. So he understands the value of the written word. He is just deeply interested in the Word of God. Of course, he is a missionary. He thinks the Word of God is what everybody needs. But what this book is about, really, is about an adventure. It is an adventure. The missionaries are on Oahu with King Liho Liho, and they want to establish, they're getting organized. They've been in Hawaii now for three years. They arrived in 1820, 21, 22, 23. They're getting some reinforcements. And they're trying to think, where's the best place to put the reinforcements with the approval of the government and the king and Governor Kuakini? So they have to have some adventurers. They have to have some fit men go back to the island of Hawaii and talk to Kuakini and say, we want to go around the entire island of Hawaii looking for the best place to put our missionary stations where we're going to take our wives and build a little house and put up a church and find the most Hawaiian people to minister to, of course. So I have made you a giant map of the island of Hawaii. You think, oh boy. And I just want to point out with my hand, our journey is going to start here in Kailua. 
This is not a grief map. But what I, the only thing I want you to realize is this is a journey that takes place on foot and on the water. And so it's highly unusual. It's not a, a trip that just anybody can do. And so they go down the coast from Kona, from Kailua, down, 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 across South Point, up here. They're going to go into Kilauea. They're going to see Kilauea Iki and Kilauea Nui, the volcano. Then they're going to go back down here and they're going to visit Kalapana, Kaimu, Kapoho. They visit the Green Crater. I mean, they go everywhere because they're on foot and they're walking and they have to spend the night. And then they go up here to Waiakea, Hilo Bay, and then up the Hamakua Coast, for crying out loud over here, here we are, up, up the Hamakua Coast, down, and they're gonna see all this beauty. They're gonna go stay in Waipio Valley and Waimanu Valley. They're gonna come up to Kohala, and down to what they call Towaihai, because Ellis is speaking Tahitian, and he speaks Polynesian with it. He uses the T a lot, as if the people in Hawaii, if you were from Hawaii, to Waihai. And then some of them go off. But it is a big trip, and it takes well over a month, and it is exhausting. And guess what? The missionaries get diarrhea. <laughs> because they're drinking brackish water. They have to drink a lot of brackish water. They have to eat undercooked potatoes sometimes. They have to eat a lot of raw fish that maybe they never ate before. Mr. Ellis is used to raw fish. But it's not simple and it rains on them and they get hot. And just imagine, these missionaries never seem to wear hats. They're sunburned. They are deeply, deeply sunburned. But we are going to start. And what I know what you want to do is you want to learn about the Hawaiian people. And the secret is so does Mr. Ellis. So does Mr. Ellis. So the adventurers on this trip, Mr. Ellis has come up from Tahiti. King Liholiho likes him very much. They've asked him to come and stay in the Hawaiian Islands. So they're gonna send Ellis because he can speak Hawaiian so well. They're gonna send the Reverend Asa Thurston because he's the one who's gonna come back. And he's the one who's been stationed in Kailua originally. He likes Kailua. He is going to come back with his cute wife, Lucy, if they all get permission. Then there's a new one. Reverend Artemis Bishop has just gotten off the ship. He's just a newcomer. There's a Mr. Goodrich. And then another man who's not even a minister. He's a mechanic. He's a really skilled white mechanic. And they're going to go around the island together. So they have to go to Governor Kuakini. And they're on very friendly terms with Kuakini. They sail over on a boat. Kuakini greets them, he gives them a house to stay in, and they say to Governor Kuakini, and they treat him with a great deal of respect because he, well, he deserves it, and he, he wants it, and he is totally in charge. They say, we'd like to go on this adventure. Can we have a canoe so someone can carry our baggage, and could we have some men to help us, and could we have a guide because we don't know where we're going? And so Governor Kuakini says yes. I will give you a guide. This fun man is Makoa. And Makoa is small, has interesting curly hair. And what's really interesting about him from, a, from anybody's point of view is he has little goat tattoos. Little goat tattoos on his forehead, kind of close to his eyes. He's got one on either side of his nose. So, Polynesians knew all about tattooing. They were doing it very well long before lots of other people were doing. And you could tell that Makoa is kind of a uh, hip kind of a guy. He's the king's messenger and he wanted goats and probably nobody else, maybe nobody else in the Hawaiian islands had goat tattoos all over their face like Makoa. And he's got this interesting beard that's curly and tied in a knot. And he's extremely helpful to the missionaries because he knows where he's going. But Makua will have a little, he'll have a little thing. And what you'll see in this image, and when you read Mr. Ellis's book, you'll see that the top of Makua's head is shaven. He's not bald. He's not bald. He didn't get bald and have all these great curls. This is probably a sign of respect and mourning. This is a traditional thing the Hawaiians did because Ellis writes about it. There are many different patterns. 
You remember the painting I showed you of Kamehameha the Great was mourning the death of his sister, and he had that interesting mohawk, and he totally shaved the side of his head. That is a traditional thing to do. So Makoa has shaved the top of his head and left a fringe around it. Europeans thought that kind of looked like a monk and left the curls behind the ears. I like it. So he is a character and he's going with them and Mr. Ellis is very happy. And so they set off apparently on something like June 18th and they set up on foot and they're here in Kona and Kona is densely populated. It is densely populated, which makes traveling with missionaries difficult because they constantly want to inspect temples. And there are a lot of heiau between their first night is going to be spent, I think it's going to be spent down at Keoho. They're gonna get as far as Keoho on their first night, which isn't very far from Kailua, maybe it's like eight miles or something, but they are going to see numerous heiau. They're gonna inspect the heiau, they're gonna see the villages, and whenever somebody comes up to them and says, we would like you to talk to us about Jehovah, they assemble a group of people and they preach in Hawaiian. And Makoa is coming. So you have to imagine some of the missionaries, they take turns. Some are walking on the land. Some are in the canoe. They say, we're going to rendezvous at night at Keoho and you hope everything is going well. And usually it is. And the missionaries know their shoes aren't going to hold up very well because they're skinny and leather and they're not used to lava. So they actually take along a piece of rawhide with them because they figured out they could make rawhide sandals to preserve their feet as they go along. And they do have some Hawaii. Kuakini has provided them with people to carry their baggage. And so they take off, but they aren't really gonna eat off the land. They're not taking a whole bunch of food with them. They're taking canteens to hold water. They're taking some Bibles and they're taking tea and sugar because I, have a feeling they can't live without tea and sugar because when they get as far as Kealakikua Bay and they're staying with Chief Naihe, they have to send Mr. Thurston back in a canoe. He leaves at sunset, gets to Kailua at three o'clock in the morning, gets back in that canoe with the tea and the sugar and comes back down the coast to Kealakikua Bay by sunrise. And he's not paddling the canoe. He has some wonderful, I don't know if Makoa is in there paddling as well, but they are, they're doing what High Chief Kuakini tells them to do, which is take care of these missionaries. So what I wanted to do was just read you a little bit from this book because it is so interesting and it'll give you such a good idea of what Hawaii was like in 1823. And so you kind of, start let us see that every page in this book is something amazing. And this first page I marked, it's about Governor Kuakini. So they have to go talk to Kuakini. They ask his blessing, really, when they go off on this trip. Yes. And um, so here's, here is William Ellis, and he's speaking to Kuakini down in Kailua. And I spoke on the desirableness of his building a place for the public worship of the true God and the advantages of keeping the Sabbath a holy day. This is very big with the missionaries. Recommending to him to set the people a good example uh -huh. and to use his influence to get them to come to church and probably turn into Christians. And Governor Kuachini is not the kind of man who's backed into a, wall, a corner. He said, it was his intention to build a church by and by when the Maka Ainana should become interested in these things and when they should have a missionary to reside permanently with them. But that at the present, the people at Kailua were quite indifferent to religion. And I love it because that is a completely honest thing on Kuakini's part. He's saying, hey, I will build a church. I will do it, but the people are indifferent. We don't have a resident missionary, so <laughs> he's, he's kind of laying out the ground rules in a very polite and wonderful way. And so they take off the next day, Ellis and the missionaries heading south on this pretty big adventure. And the first thing I have to laugh is Ellis is going down the coast, and what does he stop to write about? The governor's wife, Keoa. It sounds like a guy's name, but it's her. She's Keoa, the governor's wife. 
and her female attendants. This is 40 women under the pleasant shade of a beautiful clump of cordia or coal trees employed in stripping off the bark from bundles of wauke sticks for the purpose of making it into cloth. You see, so the missionaries aren't just charging. They're not going quick, quick, double march. They're stopping and Ellis is interested in how to make kappa because he's seen this in Tahiti and he is interested. And so here's the governor's wife, 40 or 50 women. They're all out there stripping this bark off and he describes the length of the sticks. You know, the sticks were generally from six to 10 feet long. These ladies are dealing with some big things and almost an inch in diameter at the thickest end. They first cut the bark, the whole length of the stick with a sharp serrated shell. Okay, they're not using iron implements. They are there with their sharp serrated shells that work really well. And having carefully peeled off the bark, they rolled it into small coils, the inner bark being outside, and they left it that way to get it to be flat and smooth. Keoa not only worked herself, but appeared to take the superintendence of the whole party, these 40 or 50 women. Whenever a fine piece of bark was found, it was shown to her and it was put aside to be manufactured and he calls it wa'ili'i'i. -i -i. And I think this is wa'ili'i, wa'ili'i, who knows? But it's a particular cloth. And what it means is the Hawaiian ladies, when they're making kapa, are very specific. If they see a really beautiful piece of inner bark, they know that would be suitable for something special. Some of it is coarse. And I just love it that Ellis writes about this. This entire book is an anthropological report on the people of Hawaii in 1823. That is why it is so valuable. And then he writes all about the cultivation of the Welke plant. All you friends of Amy Greenwell and out there at Uwa'awa'a, this book is loaded with stuff on plants. And then he talks about all the different kinds of kapa and how you make it and how you decorate it and everything. But we don't want to stick on with kapa. And here is the picture. See, in his book, they actually put the picture of Makoa. This is a very well illustrated book, and I think it's because Ellis was a printer and he knows that people like pictures. Yes. And then he's going to describe Makoa, our guide, Makoa, who had been the king's messenger many years and was, and was well. Of course, if he's the king's messenger, he is well acquainted with the island because he has been sent to send ministers across every place to different chiefs and everything. He led the way. He was a rather singular looking little man, between 40 or 50 years old. A thick tuft of jet black curling hair shaded his wrinkled forehead and a long bunch of the same kind hung down between behind each of his ears. Yes, the rest of his head was cropped as short as shears could make it. His small black eyes were ornamented with twinned Van Dyke semicircles. Two goats, impressed in the same indelible manner, stood rampant over each of his brows. One, like the supporter of a coat of arms, was fixed on either side of his nose, and two more guarded the corners of his mouth. I mean, Ellis is such the writer, yes. And he, and he describes his clothes, he's wearing a kihei, that light cloak that Hawaiian men and women often threw carelessly over their shoulders. Such an interesting, useful piece of clothing. Okay, so they're leaving Kailua. We pass through the villages thickly scattered along the shore to the southward. The country looked unusually green and cheerful, owing to the frequent rains which for some months past have fallen on this side of the island. This is the summertime. This is Kona's rainy season. They're kicking off in June. And it's fun to think that even in Kailua, it is so rainy. Tell name of book again. Oh, excuse me. This book, Journal of William Ellis. Journal of William Ellis. And underneath is one of those other titles that says a narrative 
of a tour through Hawaii in 1823. A narrative of a tour through Hawaii in 1823. So what this means is Mr. Ellis, in 1823, does this whole trip. He goes back to Honolulu. He wants to stay in the islands and be a missionary, but his wife is unwell. So he has to go back to England. And it may be that finally he realizes he has the time in England and the interest is so great. Probably people are saying, William, the Sandwich Islands? What's it like out there? And this man is a collaborator. He collaborates with the American missionaries who are on this trip, also keep notes, and they share their information. But Mr. Ellis is a writer. His language, his vocabulary, his interest in Hawaii is, it has no limit. This man is interested in every single aspect of everything that he runs into. He loves the landscape. Here he's just, you know, he's describing how beautiful it is, the spreading shrubs and the flowers and the side of the hills laid out for considerable extent in gardens and fields and generally cultivated with potatoes and other vegetables were beautiful. This is a man. <laughs> and he's saying how beautiful it all is. And can, this is the part, of course, we're all interested in, right? The number of heiau the depositories of the dead, which we passed, convinced us that this part of the island must formerly have been populous. The latter were built with fragments of lava laid up evenly on the outside, generally about eight feet long from four to six broad, four feet high. Some appeared very ancient. Others had evidently been standing but a few years. And again, he never makes a negative comment. He doesn't say things like, oh, oh, those, those hay hour. He doesn't say anything like, oh, they're ugly, or oh, they represent something terrible. He is just, he's like an anthropologist. He's just a good anthropologist, calm, observant, unprejudiced, which is so nice. So here he goes. <laughs> and he loves coal trees. This man loves coal trees. And he loves he loves stories. Okay, just right off the bat, they're walking down, they've just left Kailua, the Hawaiians are coming up and talking to him, and he's listening. And they're at a town that we don't even need to call its name anymore. He's past the temple to Kekialani. We know that's an, a chiefess of old in Kona, Kekialani Mohini. There are some heiau, thank goodness they're on state land. He passes her heiau and her place, and he comes to a little town, Kalua Okalani. And the inhabitants pointed out a spot called Maokareo Reo. Yeah. Interesting. The place of a celebrated giant. Now, we don't know anything about this. There's a celebrated giant of that name who was one of the attendants of Umi, okay? The great king who came down to Kailua and the Pa'o Umi and stepped on the lava rock and planted the ulu trees on the slopes. So here. Here is his, here's an attendant of Umi, king of Hawaii, about 12 generations since. And you just say, okay, generations, 25 years. Let's go back 400 years, back to Umi. And the Hawaiians know this. This is what we would call a legend. And everybody who lives there knows this story. So, um, Mao Kareoreo was so tall that he could pluck the coconuts off the trees as he walked along. And when the king was playing in the surf, that would be Umi, where it was five to six fathoms deep, Makoreoreo would walk out to him without being wet above his loins. And when he was in a canoe, if he saw any fish lying among the coral at that same depth, six fathoms down, 30 feet, he would just put his hand down and take them. So this giant is out there in his pretty big canoe, I guess, and he could just reach his hand down 30 feet and grab a fish for Umi. So Ellis hears this story. And the Hawaiians also said that he was a Mauka Reo Reo, was a great warrior, and that to his prowess, principally, Umi was indebted for his many victories. Okay. The Hawaiians are fond of the marvelous. This is, this is just an observation by Ellis as well as many people who are better informed, 
and probably this passion, together with the distance of time since Mao Ka Reo Reo existed, has led them to magnify one of Umi's followers of perhaps a little larger stature than his fellows into a giant 60 feet tall. And he, here's Ellis's brain. He's going, I'm hearing the story. There must have been a man, a big man, who was with Umi, and time has passed, and they turned it into a legend. But he doesn't, he doesn't say that. He says lots of people do things just like that, people who are better informed. He's speaking to his fellow English people, who probably believe a lot of rubbish. Yeah, so they pass all these code trees, and they're going along, and we are going to get down to Kealakikua Bay because I find this a very interesting place. And you think, okay, why? Of course, you're gonna to go to Keoho, you're gonna go past the battlefield of Kekuokolani and Monono, and they see where they are, and they see the graves of the dead warriors, because it's only happened. That battle was 1819. This is like a dozen, you know, this is 14, not even 14 years later. So those graves are fresh. People can see them, liho liho is victorious and people aren't going to forget that. So they go down there, but we are going to get ourselves to Kealakikua Bay because they are going to spend the night there with a very nice chief, Naihe, who is very sympathetic to Christianity. And when they preach at night, because they preach all the time, anytime a group of people want to hear about this new religion, because when they come into a village, they say, do you have a religion? And they say, no, we don't have a religion. The religion is gone. You know, we might have our own personal gods, but the big religion is gone. They know that. And they say, well, would you like to hear about a new religion? And, and they say yes often. Sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes everybody is restless or sometimes people are drunk because apparently Alexis wants me to talk about alcohol next time. <laughs> and there is alcohol. I don't know if this is the European influence, but you can make there is nice fermented sweet potato juice and sugar cane juice and cooked tea leaves. And people, so poor Reverend Missionary William Ellis, he's not a minister, he is a printer. He is not the Reverend William Ellis. Well, I guess he is ordained. He is the Reverend William, sorry, mistake. But he, um, he, the Hawaiians come and say, why didn't you come to Kealakikua Bay earlier? Were you afraid? Did everybody think that we were bloodthirsty because we killed Captain Cook at Kealakikua Bay? And then they have to say, no, no, that's not why. There just, there just weren't enough missionaries. Nobody had come here. But when they get to Kealakikua Bay, um, Ellis and one of his companions goes up in the cliffs because the Hawaiians, the story of Cook's death is very much alive at Kealakikua Bay. There are lots of people at Ka'avaloa who were there at the time of Captain Cook. They remember him, his death. Some of them say they're very sorry. No, they didn't. It was a mistake. And then some of them say, whoa, would you like to see, you know, where the flesh was taken from the bones? Would you like to see where his bones were put in a cave and then taken back out again because the English wanted the body back of their captain? So they, they do all this exploring that a lot of, there hasn't been that much opportunity to explore down at Kealakikua Bay. So here we are. And I want to do this. Yeah, the battle gods. Where are we? Are the gods permanent? We're going to talk all about war. Oh, yes. See, so here we are at Kealakikua, and they have interesting things. Uh, yes. And see, Ellis will just put this little bit in, which, which is interesting because we all know, well, we don't all know, but Captain Cook's death was probably precipitated because some group of Hawaiians stole a little boat off the big boat. The little boat was stolen. Cook wanted the boat back because they needed it. Cook's idea was to take Kalaniyo Pu'u, the elderly high chief, onto his boat as a hostage and say, okay, we've got your king. Please give us back the boat. He had done this in other places and it had been successful, but it didn't work out at all well here in Hawaii. But, so here we have a thing, why Cook's boat was stolen. Hey, this is a good thing to talk about. Ha, huh. we have sometimes asked them that, that, what inducement they had to steal the boat when they possessed so many canoes of their own. Yes, the Hawaiians had a ton of canoes and they were really beautiful and they sailed and paddled. They didn't need this tiny little 
glorified rowboat of the English people? They had generally answered that they did not take it to transport themselves from island to island, for crying out loud, for their own canoes were more convenient and they knew better how to manage them. But because they saw it was not sewed together, but fastened with nails. These they wanted, therefore they stole the boat and broke it to pieces the next day in order to obtain the nails to make fish hooks. Now, great big nail fish hooks. We have every reason to believe that this was the principle, if not the only motive, by which they were actuated in committing the depredation which ultimately led to such unhappy consequences. And then he speaks about the Hawaiians, that they prize nails very highly. Ah. Yes, and then here's, here is Ellis, the anthropologist. They prize nails very highly, and though we do not know that they ever went so far in their endeavors to obtain a more abundant supply as the society islanders did, who actually planted them in the ground hoping they would grow like potatoes or any other vegetable, yet such is the value they still set on them, that the fishermen would rather receive a wrought nail to make of it a fish hook according to their own taste than the best English-made fish hook we could give them. So they don't want English fish hooks. They want a nail and they want to make their own fish hook, which I think is amazing. And I didn't know that the people in the Society Islands planted nails to get more nails. That was a good idea, but it didn't work. Oh dear. Ugh. Yes. And, and for those of you who don't know about Captain Cook, because of course Ellis and all this group is going to have to relive, you know, the history of Captain Cook if you go to Kealakekua Bay, when Cook died and his body was taken away to be treated honorably by the Hawaiians and the English people asked for his body back. One of the parts they really got back that they really honored, um, portions of Cook's body returned. We found in it, yes, yeah. We found in it the hands of Captain Cook entire, which were well known from a remarkable scar on one of them that divided the thumb from the forefinger. So the hands were given back to the English. Those hands are there and they were cut and they were filled with salt to be preserved. And I think everybody was happy because they all knew it was Captain Cook's hand because they could see that scar. And what I like about it is, if you're ever swimming in Kealakekua Bay or kayaking over those waters, Captain Cook's hands are dropped into that bay and they are down there on the bottom and they've probably been eaten up by something over time but his hands were given back yes and i'm not going to describe all the other parts of his bones because it's just too ghastly okay so they go through kiali kobe and of course they get in the canoe and they paddle across from kaavaloa on the northern side over to napoopoo and they see hikiao heiau and ellis's men again they are a huge help to history because they measure the heiau. They measure them, and I'm sure they have the help of the Hawaiians, and they measure them with respect, and they do it properly, how high, how wide, and they have other descriptions which are terribly useful for the historian. And then they go down the coast, and anybody who's hiked, and I have hiked from Ka Beach down to Honau now, we're talking lava. It's not bad lava, but it's hot, and there's no water. These men are carrying, I don't know what their canteens are made out of, but they have a water problem almost all the way. And the Hawaiians are, people are kind, but the water they are drinking is brackish. It's really salty. And a lot of them start to feel pretty wretched as they come to Honau now. And of course, they're very excited to get to Honau now because this is the Pu'u Honua and um, the city of refuge, the place of refuge, right. And so we go down, we're passing all the battles of Kamehameha, Mokuohai, everything where we see everybody. And if you're interested in war, which the Hawaiians were deeply interested in war, and Ellis is deeply interested in war. You know, this is a description of the weapons of war. 
This was Ellis. This was a man. A woman would not have written this book like he did. Description of weapons. Their weapons consisted of the polo lu, a spear made of hard wood from 16 to 20 feet long and pointed at one end. The ihe, or javelin, about six feet in length, made of a species of hard red wood resembling mahogany called kawila. Again, this man's knowledge of plants and trees and what he's talking about is just fantastic. Pointed and barbed. The laau palau, a weapon eight or nine feet long, between a club and a spear, somewhat resembling a halbert, with which they were um, accustomed to thrust or strike. And the pahoa, or dagger, 18 inches or two feet in length, made of the hard wood, sometimes pointed at either end, and having a string attached. So here's your dagger. It's got a string attached to it, to its handle, which you passed around your wrist to prevent losing it in action. I mean, just this most practicality. These are, you're not gonna, you're not gonna tie a 20 foot polo loo to you. You're gonna have to pick that up and carry it. Besides these, they employed the sling. And I, I knew the Hawaiians employed the sling, but I did not know that the sling was made out of human hair. The slings were made out of human hair, plaited, braided, or the elastic fibers of the coconut husk. And the stones they employed were about the size of a hen's egg and generally ponderous pieces of compact lava from the bed of streams on the sea beach whence they had been worn smooth by the action of the water. And he describes these they employed the sling, and their stones were very destructive. You know, so Ellis doesn't just ask, oh, can I see a sling? I mean, he, he hears the story. They are destructive. They were useful. They were really terribly effective. And they had no shields. So he's talking to men. He's asking, what were your wars like? They had no shields or weapons of defense except the javelin, which they used in warding off those that might be thrown at them. They were very expert at avoiding a stone if they saw it thrown. And the spearmen excelled in parrying the thrusts of their enemy's spears. The warrior seldom went to battle with anything on except a narrow girdle around their loins to the men wearing a malo. And then they're saying some, this I thought was very interesting, some, however, wore a quantity of cloth bound round their head, which was called ahu po'onu. So po'o's your head, nui's large. I don't really, ahu. Ahu is a heap like ahu umi or a hillside. You know, it's like a heap to make your head look big, to protect your head for crying out loud, which I think is very interesting. And the chiefs were frequently dressed in their war cloaks and the helmets. But then, Ellis says, the cloaks, though they gave the, the wearers an imposing appearance, must have proved an encumbrance, you know, without affording much protection. And then he describes the helmets, which we all know those beautiful, and he thinks the helmets actually might have provided some protection because they're so thickly covered, tightly woven, thickly covered with the little glossy feathers found of the birds in the mountain. Yes. And he writes about, you know, he just, everywhere he goes, Ellis does everything. So we're moving down the coastline and you're thinking, gosh, will we ever get down there? Yes. Yeah, we are going to get down there. He meets Heva Heva, Kamehameha the Great's um, uh, Kahuna. And he says the appearance of the priest Heva Heva he says, we have often conversed with Heba Heba, the priest of Tamehameha's war god. And though there is nothing naturally repulsive in his countenance, we have been told that in the battle, he often distorted his face into every frightful form and uttered the most terrifying and appalling yells, which were supposed to proceed from the god he bore or attended. Yes. And 
what Alice talks about all the time is the force, you know, the psychological, oh my god, the psychological force <laughs> in warfare of seeing the enemy. I am always surprised that I never pay any attention. So what Ellis does, he writes completely. And what's interesting, because he's going to go around the whole island, and you think, my God, he did it. He did it. He started Kailua. It took him days and days and days. And he got over here to Kilauea. Makoa would not go with them to Kilauea. He was too scared of Pele. And let me tell you, in 1823, there were a lot of priestesses of Pele very much in action over there. And they did come out and they chanted and they asked everybody to go away. And some people were very frightened of them. But of course, William Ellis was not. Then they went down and it's just lovely. They went along that whole landscape devastated by the lava flows of 2018. I mean, they saw the Green Lake they saw Kapoho, they saw Kalapana and Kaimu, and they thought they were beautiful. And they got to Hilo, by George, they got up here, and they went into the valleys of Waipio and Waimanu, because these guys were hikers. They really could hike. Mr. Goodrich goes up and climbs up Mauna Kea. He gets up to the snow of Mauna Kea and climbs up some pu'us, which he said, and he finds a rock cairn. He finds something. He knew a visitor had been up on the mountain before, and he found that temple thing. Then they end up, they, some of them go through North Kohala. They end up at Kauai High. They see John Young, and then some of them all go back to Honolulu, and some, of course, come back to Kailua because they have to tell Kuakini, we made it. Thank you for Makoa. Thank you for letting us go around your island. It was amazing. And in the end, you're thinking, okay, did they decide anything? Yes, they did. They decided that they would send back Asa Thurston to Kailua with Lucy to be permanently established there. And this, of course, is going to be why we're going to have Mokulai Kawa Church in Kailua. And they're going to send some to Waiakea. They're going to have another family sent over to Hilo because there's water and a harbor and it looks really pleasant. And the funny thing is, when they get back to Kailua Kona, Governor Kuakini, in their absence, has built a church. He's built a church, and of course, this is, this is a huge surprise and highly gratifying to William Ellis and everybody else. And he, he designs it. And he, Governor Kuakini, is the one who says, let us take the stones from this heiau. Let us take the stones from the heiau and use them to make the foundation of our gathering place to worship. And then they, you know, it's not huge, it's not as big as Mokwai Kao, but it's like a huge halau, and it's thatched with pandanus, laohala leaves, and it has windows, and it's actually very, it's exciting. It's a large new building in Kailua. So when William Ellis comes back, of course he can preach in this place. And it's the beginning of, you know, Christianity. And there are thousands and thousands of Hawaiians who gather on the Sabbath and come to Kailua to sit beneath the shade of this structure in the broiling heat. And they do get educated. And this Kuakini and his sister Ka'ahumanu, they are the ones, they are the ones who realize the palapala, the piece of paper, that language and reading and spelling is going to propel their people forward in this new world that they can see all around them from sea captains coming in, from visitors. And they do want their people to be educated. And Huakini loves having, you know, his wife and her friends. He like these ladies are really good at this. They are good at speaking English. And he's proud of them, which is very, very nice. So when they get back into, um, into Kailua, this book, I have one minute. Okay, you poor little things. I hope, you, if you don't like Lily Mellis, this was a bad... <laughs> conversation for you but I want you to know that this I hope you can find it online he was a wonderful wonderful man and he goes back to England he writes this book and then he republishes it and it, it gets printed several times and it is a bestseller and 150 years after those missionaries went around the island of Hawaii the descendant of Asa Thurston came back and did it again so there's always more things to do on the island of Hawaii. I'm going to say aloha from Kona Historical Society here in the Greenwell store. I hope you like William Ellis. Next week, we're going to do alcohol, okay? Alcohol, because we all need some. <laughs> Goodbye.